Sci-Fi Buzz shows you special effects this week from the original Rocket Man movies to today's high-tech puppetry. Buzzing with hard sci-fi author Hal Clement, Harlan Ellison's commentary, and comic book heroes are morphing to the big screen. Somebody stop me! You know, the last episode of Star Trek Next Generation airs this week in the whole country, and our staff is buzzing about it. But the thing is, you know, there's been a lot of hype about Marina Sirtis lately on the Sci-Fi Channel, but, but I still have this thing for Tasha Yar. Denise Crosby, where are you? I miss you. And Dave, where are you going? What is this? You know, with the Next Generation ending, I'm giving up my board costume and going for nostalgia. Oh, you mean... I mean... Rocket Man. Rocket Man. Though the rocket pack has been seen in modern films like Rocketeer and Return of the Jedi, Hollywood first used the flying suit decades ago. Rocketeer and Jedi pay homage to the first rocket-propelled movie hero, Rocket Man. He appeared in a trio of sci-fi serials made over 40 years ago. The films have been released on home video. Rocket Man blasted off for the first time in 1949 in King of the Rocket Men. The hero is a two-fisted scientist who keeps an atomic-powered flying suit in the trunk of his Ford. Whenever duty calls, he makes a quick wardrobe change to become the human missile known as Rocket Man. What's that? The Rocket Man serials were produced by Republic Pictures. Even though their films were cheap, Republic turned out great special effects and stunt work. The Rocket Man flying scenes are superb. Rather than using photographic effects created in a lab, the wizards at Republic flew a life-size dummy along an immense length of wire. Today's audiences can most enjoy the Rocket Man serials for their campy charm. Even my blender has more speeds than the Rocket Pack. And you just don't hear dialogue like this anymore. Rocket Man? Where's Professor Millard? He's all right, but the tunnel is filling with lava. Hurry, Rocket Man. The plot in King of the Rocket Men concerns an evil scientist who is out to steal newly developed weapons. The serial was one of Republic's most popular, but soon TV was threatening the Saturday afternoon cliffhanger. So to compete, Republic dusted off the rocket suit in 1952 and released Radar Men from the Moon. You'll find that conquering the Earth isn't so simple. Ah, but it will be. Because of our atomic weapons, on the Moon we have an element, Lunarium. In this serial, Rocket Man was renamed Commando Cody. His nemesis is the ruler of the Moon who wants to conquer Earth. Complicating the plot was the studio's insistence that the writers work in special effects footage and props from earlier films. Maybe we can get out along that side. But what about that tank? We may be able to take care of it. The third and final Rocket Man serial was Zombies of the Stratosphere, also released in 52. The chapter play features a young Leonard Nimoy in a small role as, guess what, an alien. The story deals with some Martians who want to blow up Earth, then shift Mars into Earth's superior orbit. That would mean the destruction of the world and everyone on it. That need not concern you if you are safe with us on Mars. Rocket Man was briefly resurrected for the Commando Cody TV series in 55 before flying off into Hollywood history. Maybe he'll be back in some multi-million dollar movie or TV series. But until then, you'll have to go to the video store for this cute blast from the past. This is Jeremy Hicks from Piedmont, Alabama. And I'd like to tell you about a book I've just been treating. It's uh, The Truce of Ventura by Kathy Tyler. It uh, is a book that follows the Star Wars saga, and it um, details what happens in the aftermath of the second, second Death Star's destruction. It's a really excellent book, and I uh, hope you enjoy it. reading. You know, basically, I'm an old fart. I'm 58 years old, and I'm in sight of the grave. And as the shadow deepens over me, I think back to some of the lost treasures 
the lost treasures that live here, here in memory, here in the perfect video cassette, rather than in phosphor dot immediacy on the idiot tube and are gone forever. I think back to the wonderful books and the wonderful movies that I've seen that no one pays any attention to today because of cultural illiteracy or the fact that they've forgotten immediately. I remember, I remember when I was a kid and we would go for a ride on a Sunday afternoon, my mom and dad and I in the old Plymouth. In those days, you just went for a ride, man. You didn't go anywhere. You just went for a ride. And we would listen to the radio because they had great radio shows on. And my favorite was a show called Quiet, Please which was created by one of the great unsung heroes of fantasy fiction, a man named Willis Cooper. And the show began with the announcer, Ernest Chappell, who was one of those announcers whose voice could stop you as you went through a room, and you would be mesmerized for a moment. And he would begin by saying, Quiet, please. Quiet, please. And on this Sunday, he said a line that I have never forgotten. He said, There is a place just five miles from where you now stand that no human eye has ever seen. Five miles down. And the chill that went up my spine that Sunday afternoon is the chill I just felt. Those lost treasures and other treasures that are lost to us because of the need for gimme, 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 now, now, now. What book was written this week? What's the latest thing on TV? Are the treasures that we need to remember. I'm going to give you some of them. Look them up. This is good for your soul. Don't argue with me. When they take a convention roster of films to show, all right, we've seen The Thing from Another World a million times. We've seen The Day the Earth Stood Stills a million times. We've seen Star Wars, God knows, a million times. But what about Seconds? What about that gorgeous film based on David Ely's book, shot in black and white by James Wong Howe, with, of all people, Rock Hudson? This astonishing story of a man who gets to relive his life. You've never seen it? Oh, go look up Seconds. How about Dark Crystal? The only fantasy that has worked. All the rest of them don't work. Willow, Excalibur, all the rest of them, they suck. But, but Dark Crystal works. What about Return to Oz that got so bad rap by all the critics? Return to Oz, it ain't Judy Garland, it ain't hip hop, but Return to Oz is in the tradition of the original Oz books. Dune, don't sell it short. You watch years to come. It will have a vision that others will say, that was a film. Then you got Curse of the Demon, directed by Jacques Tourneur. Oh, based on M.R. James casting the runes, there are scenes in that will blow you out of your socks. If the Lindsay Anderson movie with Malcolm McDowell, how about The Last Days of Man on Earth, based on Michael Moorcock's Jerry Cornelius stories, and The First Men on the Moon, the Ray Harryhausen film, with that wonderful Lionel Jeffries performance. Yeah, those are great films. You can get them. They're all on video cassette. And writers... Don't talk to me about Lois McMaster Bujold and her writing this week. Don't talk to me about the latest Star Trek novel. I don't want to know from that. When you tell me that you've read Charles Beaumont and Walter M. Miller and Cordwainer Smith and Murray Leinster and Henry Kuttner and Richard Matheson and C.M. Cornbluth and Lee Brackett and Stanley Weinbaum and Jack Finney and Avram Davidson, many of whom are still alive, when you tell me you've read their great stuff, then... Then, and only then, can you tell me about the latest Jerry Purnell military novel that was issued by Bain Books. Until that time, I'm going to look on you as an illiterate. The three identities of hard sci-fi author Hal Clement, next. Enemies. The Kardashians. Oh, the weird next. It's the Borg. The Borg. The Borg. Listen to me. We're just kicking around our favorite Star Trek Next Generation the enemies here. And I say it's the Borg. It's got to be the Borg. Oh, it's, the oh, yes. the it's the Borg. What is it? The Borg. <laughs> so much for consensus. Listen to the host, huh? This is Ken Al here from Annandale, Virginia. I'd love to recommend Madman, Madman Adventures, and Madman Comics. Both Madman and Madman Adventures are published by Kitchen Sink Press. They're very hard to find, but if you write to Kitchen Sink Press, you could get this highly enjoyable miniseries, which combines the, ge the genres of sci-fi, horror, romance, humor, and superheroes. Welcome to Kevin Yeager's Crypt of Horrors. Makeup effects specialist Kevin Yeager designed the noseless host and directed the Crypt Keeper segments on HBO's dark-humored series, Tales from the Crypt. Now that the show has completed a five-year run, the ambitious artist relishes rumors of a crypt shift to the big screen. 
we, we have exhausted pretty much everything in that crypt. What I like to do is, is the feature films. In this way, you know, thinking of ideas of getting them out into a graveyard, digging up graves, you know, and things like that. And full body shots, being able to direct those wraparounds would be a great, great thing. At 31, Jaeger's work on films like Child's Play and Honey, I Blew Up the Kid has put him on a short list of specialists working steadily in Hollywood. But Jaeger learned the ropes in the industry trenches like everyone else. I came out here from Ohio and did everything pretty much, you know, with rubber bands and, and toothpicks, you know, back in, in uh, my hometown. But when I came out here, I learned how Hollywood did things, and I learned, I picked things up really quickly, trying to, you know, advance, you know, and, and uh, create things on my own. Jurassic Park threw Hollywood's effects industry for a loop with the success of its computer animation. And while Jaeger isn't interested in jumping on the technology bandwagon, he has mapped out an alternative course of action. I'm not an animator, and I don't want to sit behind a computer. You know, I want to get my hands into things. But the way I feel about it is that they'll always need the artist, who is the, the conceptual person. So maybe I'll just be doing less, getting less involved with chemicals and hurting myself. At the same time, you know, I can design and, and just uh, hopefully ask more money. On the recent canine thriller, Man's Best Friend, Jaeger made a dozen mechanical doubles of a Tibetan Mastiff. These substituted for real dogs in the difficult-to-film scenes. But because the film's ending was toned down, audiences never got to see some of his best work. We ended up uh, scrapping all these designs. I did this design of this skinned dog where his muscles and his bones and patches of hair and he, half of his face was burned away and his bottom jaw was exposed and all this and his eye was blind. It was great. Jaeger's hard work often gets minimum screen time or can end up on the cutting room floor. Even though this is just par for the course in the film industry, it's still difficult to swallow. That's the one thing that I think the, the biggest thing I had to get over when I got into this business. You think to yourself, why did I put so much into it? But the way I look at it is if, if those three seconds end up being uh, an extreme close-up, I've got to be able to put all, I, I should put all of that detail into this in case it is seen very close. A positive attitude does pay off. Jaeger says he's gotten more than one job because of his attention to detail. But he says the one thing you really need to survive in this competitive field is... A strong back. You need a strong back when you're applying makeup in a chair. You really do. Not one to sit idle. Jaeger has a career wish list for the new year. He hopes to direct an updated version of The Legend of Sleepy Hollow that he's written. Then there's the rumored Tales from the Crypt feature. And he's not ready to toss aside his truest passion. I love making characters, I think, and uh, I want to keep doing that, whether it's directing or, uh, you know, writing. I'm writing right now, so, uh, and trying to direct. So as long as I'm able to tell stories and, and, and uh, create characters, I'll be a happy man. This is Stephen Kopp calling from Lincoln, Nebraska. And I'd like to recommend the Impel Skybox trading cards. The Star Trek trading cards going back to the Star Trek original series. These cards are real good art reproductions with history on the back of each card and good photographs. The Encyclopedia of Science Fiction gives one definition of hard science fiction as imaginative literature that uses either established or carefully extrapolated science as its backbone. Our definition of hard sci-fi is easier. It's two words, Hal Clement. I became an astronomy nut somewhere around the age of seven. Uh, one of the books that uh, my father got when I asked him to interpret the uh, Buck Rogers panel that first caught my attention was uh, a, a popular astronomy book. The other was Verne's uh, Earth to the Moon. So I started science and science fiction at the same time. Hal Clement is the working name he uses when he writes. But during his teaching years, his science students knew him as Harry Stubbs. But Harry also goes by a third name when he paints. He's George Richard. <laughs> Since the early 1950s, Clement has been projecting alien environments, but they are always consistent with current scientific knowledge. His planets and aliens are described in elaborate scientific detail. I suspect it's a variety of showing off. The fact that here is another way of looking at something, and uh, I thought of it first, and here you are, what do you think of it? Uh, I suspect that the, the show-off aspect is there, and I'm not particularly ashamed of it. 
As I used to tell my students, there's nothing at all wrong with showing off. Just make sure that what you're showing off is something you're proud of. Clement's best-known work, Mission of Gravity, is 40 years old. But its detailed description of a high-gravity planet with insect-like inhabitants and their relentless upward movement against great weight is a classic. His latest book, Fossil, is set in a universe created by Isaac Asimov. This is Clement's painting of the planet's sunward side. Why do his stories indulge in such exacting detail? Mostly the fun. Uh, you start to think would this happen, could this happen, and before you've gone very far along that line, you start realizing this must happen. You've committed yourself, sometimes inadvertently, to certain chains of events or certain impossibilities that you can, under no circumstances, use. Now that Harry Stubbs has retired from science teaching, Hal Clement continues to write. But under the name George Richard, he's been concentrating on his space and planetscapes. Uh, what started me was a liking for that sort of thing. And looking at such things in science fiction art shows, convention art shows, and drooling over them without being able to afford them. Finally, about 1972, uh, I went out and bought some paints and started painting. And things like landscapes are easy because the laws of perspective are nice, straightforward, applied geometry. I suppose someday I should go to an art school and learn how to do a recognizable face or figure. Whether he's writing as Hal Clement, teaching as Harry Stubbs, or painting as George Richard, the vividness of this man's imagination continually reminds us that the universe is a wonderful place. Just down the time stream, why comic book heroes are jumping from the page to the screen. I swear this stuff tastes like Windex. <laughs> you know what my favorite episode is? The one where the game infects all the crew members and hypnotizes them, except for Wesley and that other guy. Yeah, oh yeah, that's good. But I like the one that where Tasha Yar goes back in time on another Enterprise, you know, from another timeline. Oh, that was so cool. Is that really your favorite episode? Are you still pining for Tasha Yar? Okay, so you caught me. I love her. If you want to hear from Denise Crosby, why don't you ask her to call the buzz board, see what she's up to. Come on, Denise, call right now. This is Tom Brush from Long Beach, California. A book I can recommend is The Assemblers of Infinity by Kevin Anderson and Doug Beeson. A terrific novel involving uh, lunar colonies and alien nanotechnology. One of the best things I've read in years. What evil lurks in the hearts of men? Who knows what new trend lurks in the heart of Hollywood? Comic book-based characters, especially superheroes, are taking a flying leap to the big screen. This year, Speed Racer, Time Cop, The Men in Black, The Green Hornet, and many others will all strike again on celluloid. The success of mega franchises like the Batman and Superman movies has a lot to do with why Hollywood is embracing these characters. But according to Todd Moyer of Dark Horse Entertainment, the allure goes beyond that. In this day and age, studios don't want to finance a film unless they think it's a sure bet. And Moyer says, compared to most scripts based on mere mortals, comic book characters are a no-brainer to pitch to studio execs. Well, hopefully they can look at a comic book and see it as a storyboard for a movie. For a film executive, that's a good thing, because you can look at it and say, this is a known quantity. And a perfect example is our, our hopefully our next movie called Virus. We had Chuck Farr, who's a screenwriter, write the comic book. And so we brought in a, a very talented artist to work, uh, work on Chuck's story, and then we could show the executives what these monsters look like, and they could visual, visualize it much more easily. That strategy has worked well for Moyer and Dark Horse. Their film versions of The Shadow, starring Alec Baldwin, and The Mask, starring Jim Carrey, will both open this summer. But Dark Horse hasn't cornered the Hollywood market. Stan Lee of Marvel Comics moved to L.A. a few years ago just to talk up Marvel superheroes. The results are starting to come in. Uh, at the moment, Jim Cameron is prepping a story for Spider-Man. Now, you know, Cameron is the fellow who did The Terminator, and he's determined to make Spider-Man at least as big as the Terminator, which does not depress me the least little bit. 
We have Doctor Strange in the works. We have an X-Men film that's being uh, negotiated right now. And a number of our other characters, the Fantastic Four, the Black Panther, the Ghost Rider. So I think in the next few years, you're going to see Marvel represented quite a lot on the screen. Another reason Hollywood loves these spandex-clad good guys is that they have a built-in star quality and a huge following of fans. Insatiable fans who are apt to stand in line to see their favorite hero more than once and buy the video. Characters like Spider-Man and Batman are ingrained in the psyche of people in this country. You always hear the story from people about how, you know, they're, they've never forgiven their mothers because they threw out their comic book collections. Well, I think that's, how, that's a very familiar story, and uh, they can, you know, really latch on to a comic book as, an, as a medium for which other things can spin, out, spin off of, interactive video games and um, movies and toys. Aha! Uh -huh. Could profit be a motive? Well, in Hollywood, there is no other motive. But for hardcore comic book fans, that means 1994 could be a great year at the movies. <laughs> God, rumors are flying about this last episode of Star Trek Next Generation. In fact, we got a call recently on the buzz board from this woman who says she heard we're going to get a glimpse of Captain Kirk on the final episode. Sounds pretty crazy, doesn't it? But it's the best rumor I've heard all week, so we'll go with that. Now, also a reminder, watch for the special, basically the, the farewell of the next generation here by the Sci-Fi Channel, hosted by Marina Sirtis. It's a very good special. In fact, it was produced by this woman right here, Susan Hyman. Very good job on that. Thank you. Are you telling me that Denise is She's on the on phone? the phone. Cool. <laughs> Psych. <laughs> <laughs> See you next week. Watch the mysteries of the universe unfold as the Sci-Fi Channel takes you on an amazing journey through the cosmos, inside space, tonight at 10 Eastern. Now stay tuned for Mysteries from Beyond the Other Dominion, next.